Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to the ninth Global Patients uh, Congress. I'm very uh, privileged uh, to coordinate or chair this session that coincides with 20 years of uh, uh, the establishment of EAPO, the International Association of Patient Organizations, and uh, it is the second World Patient Safety Day that we're also commemorating in the context of this uh, uh, Congress. I, am, uh, I think that uh, we should start by paying uh, our condolence and our expressing our sadness um, to, the, uh, to our dear friend, Carol Osai, who passed away uh, during the COVID crisis, who was um, a dear friend, a patient advocate, um, an IAPO board member and an interim chair of the IAPO board and um, the chair of the first chair, I think, of the uh, Global Pay Alliance of, uh, for Sickle Cell Disease. Um, we're really very sad not to have her with us, but we have her spirit, uh, devotion, and significant contribution left to the rest of us to carry on with. So, in memory, of Carol Osei, who passed away, um, we devote this uh, session with the title Blood Disorders and Access to Healthcare Services and Therapies. I will um, start by just uh, underscoring the fact that this session will explore the um, important elements of a health inequality and the opportunity that will be given um, to deliver better healthcare um, around sickle cell um, disease uh, patients and the most important complications. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll be given the chance to touch on because these are very um, uh, important, but very um, uh, difficult and complex issues to touch on new uh, therapies. Um, uh, whether these are drugs or innovative uh, curative therapies based on, on gene, uh, on gene um, uh, technology. We are very pleased uh, to say that uh, I represent the Thalassemia International Federation, of course, and the Executive Director towards uh, uh, a non-governmental patient-oriented organization that safeguards, um, as far as possible, the rights of patients in uh, more than 60 countries of the world, with patients in more than seven, 200 uh, organizations around the six uh, uh, regions of the world as defined by World Health Organization. And indeed, uh, we've got considerable experience on the inequality um, of uh, patients uh, with regard to access to quality medical and other care. And indeed, COVID-19 has magnified uh, the many challenges, particularly um, of the Western, of the, of the uh, countries outside the Western world. However, um, we are also living in an area of extremely impressive scientific and medical progress with regards to drugs and therapies. And with Thalassemia International Federation, we have seen the differences of the care provided to thalassemia patients and uh, those with sickle cell disease, um, as um, there are um, huge differences in the fragmented care, um, uh, particularly in, uh, um, in healthcare systems uh, outside the Western world. Um, it just... Um, I can remember the first days of thalassemia with the first iron chelation drug from the Vasis that gave the real hope of patients back in the 1980s um, when uh, we started um, developing this multi-care um, uh, this multi-care system for our patients from the early day of their births um, uh, ongoing that gave really uh, the um, uh, contribution, the great contribution of the increase in survival of these patients and in the quality of life. In our patients with sickle cell disease, um, we still lack this um, uh, 
uh, multidisciplinary and care from the early days, and this is what we would like to see. We would like to see um, uh, promotion of quality, um, um, the fragmented healthcare systems uh, to develop into, um, uh, into um, systems that can give the care from the early days and also access to innovative uh, drugs. So we will introduce now um, our two distinguished speakers um, and the contributors of this, present of this uh, session will be um, a representative from the industry, um, Alexis Salamanca, who is uh, Director of Global Patient Relationship, Novartis uh, Oncology, with a great experience um, in the subject um, through his work in Novartis, but also uh, in his previous um, uh, professions. Um, so the floor is yours, um, Alexi, and we are very uh, eager to hear your story um, in the context of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andrula. It's uh, really a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I would like to thank you for your kind words introducing me, but also introducing the session and the panelists. All right, so before we um, dive into the discussion about Novartis efforts and what Novartis has done and continues to do in sickle cell disease, I would just like to uh, spend a few short seconds uh, paying a tribute to Carol, Carol Osai, uh, an incredible sickle cell disease advocate. Um, I had a privilege and an honor to meet with Carol on a number of occasions. And uh, if there's one thing that um, I can sort of think about when I uh, go back uh, and, and rethink our conversations is Carol's uh, very firm belief uh, that nothing for the patients can be done without the patients. That whether we're talking about access to medicine, whether we're talking about building the infrastructure, whether we're talking about research and development and innovation, patients should be in the heart and the center of everything that we do as a pharmaceutical company, as an industry player. But the same goes to all the other stakeholders. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir because I'm speaking in front of the patient advocacy and the community experts who have been doing just that. And I would like to thank you for that. Right, so um, I was approached uh, by uh, the IAPO leadership team asking to provide an overview of what Novartis is doing in the area of sickle cell disease. And when I uh, started thinking about the outline of the presentation, it became evident that uh, it would be good to highlight our comprehensive approach to addressing the many issues that surround, unfortunately, up until now, up until today, that surround uh, sickle cell disease and affect and impact the patients, families, relatives, loved ones living with sickle cell disease. And I would like to start with Reminding everyone, uh, what you probably, some of you who attended the conference last year, uh, heard from a colleague of mine, Laura McKeveney, talking about the Novartis commitment to patients and caregivers, right? Because this is how we frame what I just said, uh, said a second ago, keeping the patients in the heart and center of everything what we do, right? So the Novartis commitment is a public uh, promise, the promise to the society, to the community, to the advocates uh, about what we do and respect and are committing to do, right? So we're putting the community perspective front and center. We try our best to expand access to our medicine, which does mean, in, and as you'll see today, uh, building infrastructure and bridging the gaps that exist. We are investing in research and innovation, conducting responsible clinical trials. Again, uh, the clinical trials that are designed in a way that truly provide innovation and help move the needle for the patients and not just uh, being meaningful from the purely clinical standpoint. Right, so I just wanted to remind all of us about that because uh, the following slides and the following part of my presentation is deeply anchored in the commitment that Novartis made to patients and caregivers a few years ago. So, and the first thing that I would like to share with you when I think about Novartis 
work in sickle cell disease space and what uh, Dr. Andrula already started talking about is the emphasis on research and innovation. But again, I would like and invite you to look at it from the angle and the standpoint, not so much the clinical diversity or different uh, therapeutic modalities or the aspect of the mode of action, but I invite you and encourage you to look at the area of unmet need, that column in um, green, if you're following the slides and, and looking at your screens right now, so that's highlighted in green. Because when we started working in sickle cell disease, what became obvious right away is uh, the, the, the very wide and the broad spectrum of the unmet needs uh, as seen by the patients. And I think we tried our best to align our research and um, drug development efforts with those area of unmet needs. And just to name a few, for those of you who may be less familiar with sickle cell disease as a condition, as a chronic condition, uh, we definitely want to pursue cure, right? We don't know if it's gonna happen two, three years down the road or in the near future, but definitely something that we heard from patients loud and clear that this is what's actually needed, right? So we're definitely making attempts in pursuing that. But then more importantly, in mid and short term, uh, what the hallmark of the sickle cell disease, what patients mentioned very, like right away when you start asking them about help us understand what it's like to be living with sickle cell disease is what's called uh, a pain crisis, right? Or, uh, you know, using the scientific term, the vasoclusive crisis, right? Those really, really bad, bad pain um, occurrences where patients just cannot function, right? And they require, some of them require hospitalizations and very frequent visits to the emergency rooms and urgent care. Right, so definitely something that Novartis would like one day to say, you know what, we've contributed to alleviating the people suffering related to the sickle cell disease uh, pain crisis. And then some other areas, unfortunately, that are many, right, so definitely thinking about sickle cell disease and the long-term internal organ damage, right, so this is uh, a very insidious disease and uh, may not uh, the long-term uh, long organ damage may not be very apparent right away, but it does affect uh, the people's life expectancy and other comorbidities that they may develop with the sickle cell disease. Right, so I think the purpose of this slide is again to say that we do listen, we do collaborate with the community, and we do our best to align even our early research with the areas of the greatest unmet need as seen by the patients. So this is area number one or pillar number one anchored in uh, research and development. So now I would like to reference another great point that Dr. Andrula made in her introduction and talk about uh, building infrastructure and building capacity and also capabilities as it relates to sickle cell disease. Right, so on the slide that you're looking at right now, there's a brief overview of the Novartis program in Africa. Right, again, for people who may be less familiar with sickle cell disease, right? So why Africa, right? So it, it may be a very obvious question, but a very important one, right? And I would like us to just uh, think about for a second that uh, the, uh, the Africa continent, uh, many Africa countries, uh, they have the largest amount of people suffering from um, sickle cell disease, right? So the numbers are staggering and quite, uh, quite, quite hard to digest. Right, so uh, we're talking about people, the newborns, right? So we're talking about newborns and infants who uh, will not be able to live in the majority of the cases uh, uh, up until they turn six years old, right? So there is a huge and a very clear significant unmet need in terms of treatment options, uh, diagnostic, newborn screening, but also related to that access to treatment, right? And when we started looking at this, what became very obvious very soon is that in order for us to even try to improve the outcomes for people living with sickle cell disease, we need to contribute and create this multi-stakeholder project and innovative solutions that would then support the governments, the ministries of health, uh, you know, the uh, civic societies, the community, the patient advocacy organizations, support them in uh, finding ways to work together in order to achieve the goal of 
helping and supporting people with living, uh, living with sickle cell disease. And what you also can see on this slide, and I'm not gonna go into a detailed description of every single project or tactic that we have devised. So definitely the emphasis we're trying to make is in uh, strengthening the healthcare ecosystem. This is what I just tried to explain. Um, uh, we, we definitely want to make sure that we accelerate access to sickle cell disease treatment and help build the infrastructure on the ground so the hospitals are able to provide the treatment to the patients in a safe way. Right. So, and we're not talking about necessarily Novartis treatments only. We are talking about the whole complex of care that uh, sickle cell disease patients need. Right. So, and this is, we believe, is still an enormous gap that we are trying to cover together with other stakeholders. And I think um, another very important and near and dear topic to my heart is uh, the advocacy work with the. Uh, nonprofit organizations, civic societies, patient advocacy groups, and communities to uh, really create and raise awareness about sickle cell disease. In, in Africa, more so than in any other countries, and um, my, my, my uh, uh, other fellow speaker, Judy, from the Global Sickle Cell Disease Coalition will probably touch upon that, but uh, another, you know, if we talk, if we think about the clinical, kind of hallmark of the clinical, um, in sickle cell disease, that would be the pain crisis. But when we talk about one thing that the community struggles with and believes is the most challenging part of living with sickle cell disease is the stigma, right? So we all know that uh, very often there is that stigma associated with living with a chronic condition. But with sickle cell disease, it is especially pronounced and it is especially prominent in Africa, right? So our attempts are directed towards educating, informing, and raising awareness and raising the profile of the disease so people can understand. Because it's very hard, it's very hard to even try to find solutions for something that people don't understand or are afraid of, right? And this is what we are trying to do together with our partners um, in, 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 in the many countries in Africa. Right, so that was the second part. The second part related to building the infrastructure and working together, working in this multi-stakeholder driven approach to um, help and provide better support to the community. And then the last one, right? Uh, the last slide is and has to do with how Novartis um, works specifically with the uh, community organizations and how we co-create many of the projects and many of the um, activities that I covered today, right? So again, this slide connects directly with the first one that I shared today, speaking about the Novartis commitment to patients and caregivers. Thank you, Thank you very much, Alexa. We, we would have liked to, you know, uh, have all your slides on, but the time is over. And, uh, I'm told that I've got to be very strict on time, but you've touched very important points on the patients' uh, focus uh, of industry, giving uh, so much attention to the patient focus on the patient collaboration, but also the multi-stakeholder project that you have been describing in Africa is uh, truly of great interest, and this is how we should be working um, in, uh, in areas where we need improvements, multi-stakeholder, uh, collaboration is uh, extremely important. Uh, I just avoided um, describing the disease in the beginning, and I, I ought to say that sickle cell disease and thalassemia are among the most common, if not the commonest, rare anemias around the world. And uh, of course, seven percent of the human population carries a pathological gene. But I am leaving the pathology and the clinical outcome of this uh, important rare anemia to my friend Judy Grandinson, who is uh, our second um, uh, speaker, uh, president, current president of the Global Alliance for Sickle Cell Disease, has been the president and still is, I think, the president of the um, uh, Children's with Sickle Cell Disease in Toronto. The floor is yours, and we're very interested to hear of the patient's perspective on sickle cell disease, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Let's make sure I'm, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Judy, I can hear you. Just making yes. sure, sorry. 
so uh, thank you. My name is Judy. I am, uh, as Dr. Andrula said, the new president of uh, GASCO. I'm also the president of Camp Jamoke here in Toronto. We send children living with sickle cell disease to camp every, sum every summer. Um, um, above all of that, I'm the parent of a child with sickle cell disease. So that's what brings me to the work in the sickle cell disease space. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at just a few things briefly. Uh, first, I'll talk a bit about uh, who GASCO is and what we do. Uh, I'll take a look a little bit about uh, things that happen in the life of someone with sickle cell disease. Um, some of the barriers to accessing care, some of the things that my uh, co-presenter touched on, Alexi, thank you, and a little bit about the need for blood. Uh, so the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organizations was formed to be a unifi uni global unifying voice uh, for those affected by or interested in sickle cell disease. Uh, this includes patients, uh, parents, carriers of sickle cell disease trait, caregivers, healthcare providers, national and regional sickle cell disease organizations, educators and advocates, community representatives, and others with an interest in sickle cell disease. Uh, GASCO was inaugurated in Amsterdam, Netherlands on January 10th, 2020, and it's the first established organization representing individuals living with sickle cell disease. Uh, globally. So our vision is to reduce global incidence of sickle cell disease and ensure equitable access to optimal care and treatment by all people with sickle cell disease worldwide. And our mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of all people with sickle cell disease worldwide. Um, the key priorities that we have are the first is education and awareness. Uh, so we want to raise public and government awareness and knowledge about sickle cell disease globally. Uh, the second is advocacy, to strengthen advocacy for sickle cell disease globally by bringing vigor to uh, unified advocacy in support of evidence-based interventions. Uh, research, we'd like to help bridge the gap in clinical care, trials and research and education about sickle cell disease uh, in the low, middle and high income countries and also care and treatment. Uh, so the priority is to spread good practice globally, including the development, uh, dissemination, and implementation of clinical care guidelines, and to support the development and sustaining of global sickle cell disease, comprehensive and prevention programs, especially in countries with low and medium resources. So just a few facts uh, about sickle cell disease, some you may be familiar with, but sickle cell disease is uh, one of the most frequently occurring genetic disorders in the world. Uh, approximately 5% of the global population are healthy carriers of a gene for sickle cell disease or thalassemia. Annually, an estimated 300,000 babies are born uh, with severe forms of these diseases. So what distinguishes sickle cell disease from other hemoglobinopathies? Uh, that answer would be for me, pain. Uh, if I think back to when my son was younger, about eight years old, I asked him to describe for me what his pain felt like. And he said it felt like someone was stabbing him repeatedly in the same place with the biggest, sharpest knife that they could find. Um, that's heartbreaking. I've been trying to understand and imagine what that pain must feel like ever since I heard that description. Uh, so what causes this pain? Uh, vaso occlusion, uh, painful episodes uh, occur and due to vaso occlusion in the bone. That's the crisis, the pain crisis. Uh, most, it's the most frequent complication in many sickle cell disease patients. Uh, in vaso occlusion, the sickled red blood cells may block circulation, primarily in post capillary venules, where the blood vessels are narrowest and the hemoglobin oxygen concentration is the lowest. And this can cause damage to any organ in the body as we heard earlier. Um, the other thing is hemolysis and that's a damage to red cell membranes uh, causes a breakdown. Uh, the shortened lifespan of sickled red blood cells also causes anemia in individuals individuals with sickle cell. And hemolysis can be associated with complications such as pulmonary hypertension and skin ulcers, and this is due to a narrowing or increased pressure 
in blood vessels in some areas. Uh, other complications of sickle cell disease uh, of daily life uh, include, but are not limited to, uh, stroke, uh, priapism, and multi-system organ failure. So some of the barriers uh, that we experience to accessing care, uh, uh, in addition to physical and resource barriers, there are also a number of institutional barriers faced by sickle cell disease patients when it comes to accessing care. Uh, knowledge deficits uh, is the first. Uh, lack of care providers with specialized knowledge in hemoglobinopathies uh, in, and in sickle cell disease in particular. Uh, lack of knowledge leads uh, healthcare providers to become hesitant to manage sickle cell disease patients with complex care needs. And very important is a lack of patient knowledge about their illness can also become a barrier when patients are incapable of advocating for themselves effectively. Uh, the next barrier is the suspicion of addiction. Uh, pain is invisible. It's also subjective, which makes it difficult to measure. Uh, sickle cell disease patients present with pain atypically and are often able to carry out some normal activities of daily life. So healthcare providers who doubt pain reports from patients often delay the administration of pain medications on the basis that they believe that sickle cell disease patients are drug seeking, even though there's no evidence to support that belief. Uh, the next uh, barrier is hospital visits. Uh, complicated sickle cell disease cases require more frequent hospital visits than patients with other chronic conditions. Uh, again, poor healthcare provider attitudes towards patients contribute to the frequency of visits as well as to a patient choosing to delay seeking help, uh, which can exacerbate, exacerbate the original problem and cause longer hospital stays. And finally, the failure to plan for patient discharge and beyond can also lead to readmissions. Uh, the fourth barrier to accessing care is uh, the drug seeker label that many try to avoid. Um, also, the lack of adherence to established protocols where applicable by healthcare providers. Uh, longer wait times in emergency departments than other patients with chronic conditions. And pain is the primary complication of sickle cell disease, which means opioids are the primary treatment. And that makes patients susceptible to discrimination and unconscious bias. Uh, the last thing I wanted to look at is just the need uh, for blood. Uh, blood transfusion is one of the most effective tools used in disease modifying treatment and in the prevention of the complications of sickle cell disease. Uh, transfusions can be useful in acute and emergency tra treatments or as a part of a care plan where indicated. Uh, so top-up transfusion is used to correct oxygen carrying capacity in the blood in an acute situation. And then there's uh, exchange transfusions uh, that are used to reduce the level of uh, sickle hemoglobin relative to normal hemoglobin, which increases oxygen carrying capacity and also reduces sickling and vaso occlusion. Uh, some of the complications of transfusion include alloimmunization, iron overload, and infection. So with that said, iron overload should be continually uh, assessed and treated with iron chelation therapy. Uh, so finally, just to wrap it up, uh, uh, those living with sickle cell disease do suffer painful episodes called vaso-occlusive crisis as a primary complication of daily life. Uh, barriers to accessing care are primarily related to human factors, uh, knowledge gaps, stigmati stigmatization, and bias. And while blood transfusion and exchange can be effective treatments for sickle cell disease, both come with complications and should be closely monitored by healthcare providers. Uh, so if you wish to learn more about GASGO and what we do, please feel free to visit our website. It's scdglobal.org. And sorry, those are just mine. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for this excellent and comprehensive information that you have provided to your organizations. Um, we are 
uh, I need to take a few questions, perhaps. Um, the, one of the difficulties and one of the weaknesses that we have uh, um, encountered in our uh, long-term uh, um, history, let's say, in uh, different countries of the world where both the Lacinia and sickle cell disease patients are within the same association, uh, was really the lack of guidelines, guidance uh, of healthcare professionals, uh, particularly for sickle cell disease. And, uh, um, you're right in saying that lack of knowledge of uh, healthcare professionals is a very important barrier towards uh, quality care. And um, there is, uh, we're very happy to see the Global Alliance being developed because the, the science and the development of the in, uh, innovative therapies is so impressive in this last uh, uh, decade that we really need to find for uh, access of these patients, and not only access, but uh, prompt access and uh, identification of those tools and policies that will help governments understand the value of patients using these innovative therapies in saving the pain, uh, quality of health and life of patients, but also saving resources uh, by providing promptly these um, innovative therapies. And we're very, very privileged to have her Alexi uh, giving very comprehensive information on this innovation and yours uh, from the patient's perspective. Uh, could we have a couple of questions? Um, perhaps, um, shall I read out perhaps? Um, congratulations on the explanation of sickle cell disease in Brazil as well as in many nations there is high prevalence among the homeless population new technologies are presenting themselves as promising a giant game for people with sickle cell anemia indeed as i said uh, but there is a movement of reclassification as a rare disease you can kindly comment on the scenario on the topic in the countries that we present so uh, i think the question is whether sickle cell disease can still remain under the classification of rare disease but uh, based on the European and the American disease uh, and, and the United States classification for rare disease, it still falls under um, this uh, classification. Although in certain areas and in certain um, uh, uh, countries and communities, sickle cell disease, as in the case of thalassemia, is, is very common. Um, but, uh, uh, in the context of the population geography and the population epidemiology as a whole, in the indigenous population, it is still considered as rare. Um, perhaps um, uh, Judy would like to comment on this? No. Um, there is another question. Um, Judy. Judy, yes, could you comment on this? I'm sorry, I, I was just going to actually agree with you from the perspective that I see it's still considered to be a rare disease. Um, again, the number is is so low in, pop, in the global population, uh, again, being about 5%. Um, I think you had said seven earlier, Dr. Anjula, but uh, from my perspective, yes, to my knowledge, it's still classified as a rare disease. If I may quickly add to that, Dr. Andrew, if you allow me 30 seconds, right? So I think it's important to understand what, what's sort of behind the classifications because, you know, uh, it's not either bad or good, right? Because we've seen in some countries the diseases that actually fall under the umbrella of rare diseases receive more governmental funding and are being paid more attention from the research and uh, the academic community because they're rare diseases. So there is a higher recognition of the higher and that need that comes with that, right? But I certainly understand that it may be a wrong designation for sickle cell disease because there are so many patients, especially when we go to countries in some countries in Africa or in big countries like India or Brazil that just go simply undiagnosed, right? And I think that numbers that we are uh, providing right now, 5% or 7%, are not entirely accurate, right? So, and I think if we start paying more attention, using the technologies, going to the rural areas and the villages and the communities, I suspect we may uncover many, many, many more people who are living with the sickle cell disease undiagnosed in any official databases. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mara. Sandrola, could you wrap up the session and we yes, would like yes, to not conclude the conference? Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you so everyone. much, Yago, for giving us the opportunity of discussing hemoglobin disorders and rare blood. And uh, I, I would like to comment on your 25 years of uh, Yago um, uh, for me. But, uh, you know, wrapping up is really touching on what Alexi has just said because. And uh, what the numbers we have about this hemoglobin disorder, sickle cell disease and thalassemia, uh, I, I would truly believe are grossly underestimated because across the world there is considerable problems in, of, the, of early diagnosis, accurate diagnosis, and of course taking depth of care. What we need to have in mind is that patients should remain in the focus of our attention, of the governments, of the industry, multi-state quarter, uh, a project and uh, uh, initiatives should be taken, and innovation is very important uh, to consider that despite rarity, every patient has the right to have access to this innovation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I will now ask my chair, the Dr. Radna Devi, to say the last word on this and Carol Osai's memory and everybody's contribution. Thank you, Radna. Yeah, thank you. And this session is very, very special to us because it is dedicated to one of our board members. And Andrea, you would know that you are also one of our past board members. Carol joined us, um, you know, in November last year, and we lost her in April. She was there for a very, very short time, but then her contribution was fantastic. She was always enthusiastic. She wanted to start a youth wing. And in spite of her having conflicting, you know, um, requirements at home, her mother was sick, her child needed her, she was always ready to offer her help. And this talk is especially in her memory. And we would like to continue with this talk every, at every Congress. And we would love the participation of more patient groups to contribute to this. So thank you very much for this very, very in, uh, important session and a very good discussion on the topic. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, viewers and everybody. Uh, can we now join us in the summary of the day? Uh, please go into the auditorium and join the last session of the day. Uh, thank you, everybody who has contributed all day. I think it's been such a fascinating day. I could have continued. Uh, those of you who are still now entering into your morning session, we said, Good afternoon to you, and now you are joining us again, and we're saying good morning. Uh, and those who are leaving us, uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.